look, let's do a look, quick, quick little recap. You ready? We started in Galatians 1, talked about the challenges that the Apostle Paul had. I love Galatians. I think it's probably one of the most important books of the Bible. I mean, if, if this wasn't written and Paul didn't do he did historically and contend for us in this passage. As I tell you, we might have some form of church that looks kind of weird today, but thank God Paul contended for the gospel like he did. It's a powerful, powerful. I mean, Martin Luther said, Martin Luther in the Reformation said, the book of Galatians is my battle axe. It's my battle axe. It's what I use to get breakthroughs. So that's, that's fantastic stuff. But the challenges, chapter one, Paul introduces himself, and the challenges that he facing in this book and in this area was that some were coming and saying, Paul's not an authentic guy. He's not a real apostle. You know, he, he, you know, he's not the guy. So he had to defend his apostleship and he wasn't afraid to do it. And he stood very strong on it. He said, I'm an apostle, not from man, but through Jesus Christ. So be quiet. Uh, second to last verse in the book is so good. Second to last verse in the book of Galatians says, now don't bother me anymore. Don't bring this up again. I bear in my body the mark. So stop it. It does. Read it. Go ahead. It's really cool. And it means it like that. It's literally, he finishes the, he writes this whole book and then he says, that's enough. I'm not doing this again. I love it. Okay. All right. So, so Paul, you know, had to deal with that. They said, he also said, you know, you're, well, he's watering down the message. He's, he's making it too easy. It's not that easy. I mean, it's not just about accepting Jesus. We embrace that aspect as well, but we believe that you still got to keep the whole law and you got to be circumcised. And, you know, and when he says you don't have to, and the law was fulfilled, he's wrong. You still got to do all the stuff. So he said, I know the message I got from the Lord. I know what he shared with me clearly. And it did not include circumcision and the law. It was a gospel of liberty it was a gospel of fulfillment of the law it was a gospel that in christ jesus all these things are complete and you cannot earn your relationship with the father and so he was battling that hardcore so these were the things he was confronting galatians chapter 2 he went down he says let me tell you also i mean i went to jerusalem for you guys i mean it wasn't i, I contended for the gospel one time i went to jerusalem and and i took barnabas and titus with me and titus is important because he was a greek guy an uncircumcised greek guy and i took him down and i took him on purpose to say you know all these people you're talking about up there that need to be circumcised and honor the law well i brought one with me i got one in the room so let's really talk about the real people let's not you know philosophize about a group in our little ivory tower these are real people we're talking about and i love it because i mean titus i could see him he says it was for about an hour about an hour it was an aura there was a, a period of time where we were you know contending about this and i could see titus with a couple of drops of sweat going I hope this goes well, you know, but anyways, uh, but we, we, we see that Paul went down and he said, I do not want to be doing what I'm doing in vain. Now, some have said, well, he, he wanted to submit his gospel to the leaders so that well, his word wasn't going in vain, so that his message wasn't a vain message. It has nothing to do with that. He got the word. He was sure of his word. Better translations in the New Living Translation in the message, it says, I wanted to make sure that we were in agreement for fear that all my efforts had been wasted and I was running the race for nothing the message says i didn't want anybody exposing my years of work to denigration or endangering my personal ministry my present ministry he's like look i've been working hard i mean i was stoned in one of those cities and thrown out for dead i mean i've been, I've been pressing really hard to get a breakthrough among the gentile people and i'm not gonna have you coming behind me and messing this thing up so that's what he said. I said, I even went to Jerusalem and I contended with all the hoi polloi and all the people who thought they were all that. And I contended with them over this issue right there in Jerusalem. And Jerusalem, by the way, a pretty interesting church, a lot of ethnic crazy stuff going on. And wow, it was, there was an intense struggle there. But I got a breakthrough there because here was their summary. Here's how they summarized the whole thing in Acts 15, 19 and 20. The summary of that meeting was, therefore I judge that we should not. This was James, the half brother of Jesus who rose up as an apostle in Jerusalem. He said, therefore, I judge that we should not trouble. The NLT says we should not make it difficult for those among the Gentiles who are turning to God. We should write them to abstain from things polluted by idols, which might have made sense in the context of their day. We don't really have that. You don't have it. You know, Metro, you know, the idolatry table. We don't have that one there. But anyway, it was meaningful then. But, but also this meaningful today to abstain from uh, sexual immorality. Stop it. All right, abstain. It doesn't say just avoid it. It says abstain from sexual immorality and from things strangled and from blood. But, I mean, just bring attention again to that. Don't 
make it hard. Like, don't trouble the people. They're literally saying, you know what, we should, we should welcome the people in. Oh, they're watering down the gospel. No, we're not. You know what, a five-year-old child has, has enough of capacity to believe that Jesus died for me. I want him as my savior. I mean, God made the bar pretty low. He really did. He wants you to come in, accept me. If you, if you accept me, if you receive me, I give you the right and privilege to be a child of God. Okay, so we came to the conclusion that adding anything to Jesus in order to be accepted by God threatens the very freedom of the church. Galatians 2.21, we're going to read today, I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died in vain. Galatians 5.4, you who attempt to be justified by the law, you have fallen from grace. See, falling from grace isn't you're sinning too much, you're falling from grace. Falling from grace is when you start teaching people that they got to do a whole bunch of stuff to earn their relationship and be approved by God. That's just false. And if you do that, you've fallen from grace. What have you fallen from? You've fallen from the message of the gospel, which is the grace of God. So that's falling from grace. All right. All right. So uh, let's move on. Truth and freedom are at stake. These three things will happen. He said the ministry to real people is going to be undone. Our freedom is lost and we become slaves again. And number three, we exchange the truth for a lie. Amen. Good recap, Pastor. Good job. All right. Amen. Those who haven't been here both weeks, say thank you. Okay. All right. Galatians 2.11. Let's look at that. Get your Bibles, whatever it is. And I only got a couple of verses up on the screens, not the whole thing, but read with me. It says, now when Peter had come to Antioch, now not just the Jerusalem council, but there's another occasion. So he's writing to the Galatian church and he's saying, in Jerusalem, I want to, I want to tell you about an event we had in Jerusalem. All right. It's kind of like last week I met a bunch of guys. I want to tell you about it. It's relevant to the story. It's relevant to my letter. Well, he's saying I was in Jerusalem. This is what went down. And not only that, but in Antioch one time here, it is. You ready? In Antioch, one time Peter came up to Antioch. I withstood him to his face. Face to face. I withstood him to his face because he was to be blamed. Say blamed. The New American Standard says he stood condemned. He stood condemned. He was doing something awful. He was in a posture of sin. He was in a posture of missing the mark. He was in the posture of being condemned. He was to be blamed. Did I make that straight? Face to face, I got up in his business. Before a certain man came from James, he would eat with all of the Gentiles. I mean, he got the message. I mean, he was the one who got it first. He was the one who the sheep was dropped down, all the filthy animals, and God said, kill and eat. And he said, no, Lord. But the Lord said, don't call unclean what I've called clean. And then he went out and opened the door to the Gentiles. I mean, he had that revelation, and yet here we are years later, and when some Gentiles came from James, he decided to separate from the Gentiles who he ate with before it was all chummy chummy i mean no dietary rules no special jewish things we didn't have to have two ovens and and two sinks and two of this and 20 of those i mean he ate with everybody he even ate some pretty funky stuff that these gentiles were cooking but then when the jews came he's like oh better slide over here with those folks weird that's all relative today, folks. There's lots of people, hypocrites, they get into a party spirit, and you know, I hang with these people, I hang with these people, I'd never be seen with those people. Well, here's Peter, I'm seen with you people, love ministering to you people, having communion together, doing all that. Oh, the folks from James came, slide over here, separate from them. How many think of that kind of stuff happening in a church, we'd say, what's the deal with that? Well, this was going on. And Paul was really upset about it. I mean, Paul was excellent. He was a Jew of Jews. He was a rabbi of rabbis. He could teach on all the rituals and everything. He was excellent above anybody else, Paul says, by revelation by the Spirit. Paul says, I was a better Pharisee than any of them. So, I mean, he knew this stuff, but he knew we were delivered from it. We're not going back to that. The new covenant doesn't include this stuff. Are you with me? All right, so look what it says. Now he went and he became, but when they came, he withdrew and he separated himself. Look at the next phrase, fearing those. Say fearing. Fearing those, fear of man is a snare. Fearing those who were of the circumcision, or another translation says there were people of the party of the circumcision, which means in the church in Jerusalem, you had a whole bunch of different sects. And one of those sects was this group who were of the circumcision, that you, you accept Jesus, but you're not really fully saved unless you're circumcised. And you got to do that too. There's Jesus and. And when those people came, I don't know why, but they had a pretty strong influence on Peter, and Peter was willing to give up on the gospel 
Oh, it's not a small deal. Come on, Pastor, just a small deal. Probably some friends, people he knew. He was giving up on the gospel. He was standing in a place of condemnation. And Paul said, I got right up in his business, right in front of everybody. He said, what are you doing? Thank God we don't have any of those meetings anymore. Sounds like one of those old scary church business meetings, eh? We want the red carpet. We want the green carpet. We want porcelain tiles on the roof. We want flat shale single. Crazy stuff. But I mean, this is serious because Peter literally was, was changing the gospel. Changing it. And if you add one thing to it, you empty it of its power. It's a wonder we have a powerless gospel today. We don't. But when you mix it and mess with it, we have trouble. Okay, and the rest of the Jews also played the hypocrite, played the hypocrite, and they went with them. It got so bad that even Barnabas was carried away with their hypocrisy. He betrayed his own convictions, and he behaved like the gospel isn't true. The gospel I preach that you're free from the law, the gospel I preach that you're saved only because of your confession of Jesus Christ and the finished work of the cross, that gospel got, con got condemned, that gospel got messed up, that gospel was completely changed because of their behavior. Verse 14, but when I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth, of the gospel. They were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel. I said to Peter before them all, if you being a Jew live as a man of the Gentiles and not as a Jew, why do you compel Gentiles to live as Jews? We who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles, not, not we were not Gentiles before. He said, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, knowing that, now listen, not justified by the works of the law, but by faith now listen, the King James Version says the faith of Jesus. It doesn't say faith in Jesus. It says the faith of Jesus, and that actually is a better translation. It's a much better translation because we are, the gospel is that Jesus is faithful, Jesus is true, Jesus did what he did, and it is authentic, it is real, and it is faithful and dependable. And because of what he did, because of his faith, we can come into the very faith of Christ himself, and we can exercise our faith in the faith of Jesus Christ. That's where our redemption comes from. It comes from what he did. It comes from the finished work of Jesus, not from my efforts. Because that's where faith gets turned into a work. You see, I got justified because of my faith no you got justified because of his faith that's actually a better translation that's why we got we turned faith into an idol we turned faith into a work we turned we turned having faith into what really makes my life happen when what it is it is there is faith we must have faith but it's faith in the faith of jesus it's very important to understand that. And it's here a couple of times. And Paul is doing that. And those words should be done that way, especially in the epistle of Galatians, or it loses its understanding. He says, the faith of Jesus Christ, even when we believed, we believed, the faith of Jesus Christ, our faith, we believed, we believed in Christ Jesus, that we might be justified by the faith of Jesus. Christ Jesus. It should be the faith of Christ Jesus. Now, it's not up in your slide. It's in your Bible, though. If you have a King James Version, then there's a few times where the King James actually is the best. We have translators who thought, I think faith in Jesus is a better way to do that. But they changed the complete meaning of it, and they literally put us into a self-righteous place where my faith did this. Your faith didn't do it. It's your faith in the faith of Jesus Christ that did it. Very different. If you don't get it, say, Holy Spirit, help me get that revelation, because it was very important in the epistle of Galatians. Thank you, Pastor. All right. The faith of Christ and not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. He said, because of your actions, you're preaching a different gospel. Peter, your behavior is putting the whole gospel at risk. Everything you're doing and not confronting this bad behavior would put the gospel at risk. So Peter had to be withstood. He had to be confronted. He had to openly be shown that he stands condemned. Pretty strong language, and it's meant to be because something very, very serious is at risk here. Thank you, Pastor. Verse 17, but if we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves also being found sinners, is Christ therefore a minister of sin? Now, this all sounds a bit hard to understand, but hang in there. For if I build again those things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. For I, though the law died to the law that I might live to God, 
I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live in the faith of the Son of God. Bad translation, I live by the faith of the Son of God. Bad translation, actually, it's by the faith in the Son of God. Bad translation. It's I live in the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Verse 21, I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died in vain. The whole cross, his whole life, if the law is added to this in one little bit, just a speck of the law is added to this, his death was in vain, and we have a different and a powerless gospel. We have a behavior club, and that's the best it is. All right, we're going to have another behavior lesson this week, how you folks been behaving. I gave you a behavior lesson last week, so we're going to do Sin Management 103 today. How to... He didn't come to help you manage sin. He came to obliterate it in himself so that you were free from sin once and for all. He came to separate you as far as the east is from the west, from your iniquities and from your sin, and set you free from every transgression. Quiet, I know it's exciting. Wow! Let me give you the message. I know the message is a paraphrase, but let me look at the message in verse 17 to 19. Have some of you noticed that we are not yet perfect? I got it up on the slide so you can see it. Have some of you noticed that we are not yet perfect? This is Paul writing to the the Galatian church. Have some of you noticed that we are not yet perfect? (laughs) No great surprise, right? Are you ready to make the accusation that since people like me who go through Christ in order to get things right with God aren't perfectly virtuous, Christ must therefore be an accessory to sin? Because I'm saying it's only Christ and yet people are still screw-ups, if I'm saying only Christ and you're not seeing absolute change, you want to add law to that, right? You want to say, well, it is Jesus, but then you have to go into behavior modification courses. You might have had a hurt sometime in your past and you need to go to a conference for three days, fall in your face, and have an inner healing conference we got to add all kinds of other little things because the cross was not powerful enough to totally set you free. It is for freedom that Christ set you free. Yeah, but sometimes you got to do that stuff. Well, we had an inner healing today. It was a quick revelation. You had a hurt, a pain. It was a wrong thought, a wrong process. Be healed right now. You know, my my father-in-law, when he got saved, he was in a psych hospital, tried to kill himself. They put him in a straitjacket because he tried to hang himself, slit his throat, all kinds of messy stuff. One phone call over the phone, say this prayer after me, Tom. Tom accepted Jesus after the phone. He was totally delivered from from drug addiction, from alcohol, from, from the brokenness, from the depression, from all the pain in his heart. His life changed in an instant. Somewhere we've lost the instantaneous miracle and power of the gospel because we've added all kinds of stuff to it. That's what I think, and that's what I believe the Apostle Paul was saying. He said, you make that accusation to me. You say, you know, because I'm not perfectly virtuous, then, you know, not much of a message. Christ must therefore be an accessory to sin. The accusation is frivolous. If I was trying to be good, I would be rebuilding some old barn that had been torn down, and I would be acting as a charlatan. What actually took place is this. I tried keeping the rules. I tried working my head off to please God. It didn't work. So I quit being a lawman so I could be God's man. Christ's life showed me how, and it enabled me to do it. Thank you, Pastor. The NLT, the New Living Translation. But suppose we seek to be made right with God through faith in Christ, and then we are found guilty because we abandoned the law. Well, would that mean Christ has led us into sin? Absolutely not. Rather, I am a sinner if I rebuild the old system of the law. That's what Paul was really trying to bring attention to, is that the sin isn't the person who successfully screwed up after they accepted Jesus. The sin is somebody who observed that and decided that we better add some law to this because we're not getting the results we'd like. So we better add some stuff to this. You know, they got them saved, but now we better add some behavior modification and some other stuff to it because we need to get certain results. And so they add all of this stuff to it. And what Paul said is, if you add anything to the gospel, you're the sinner. Give me the next slide. Look at the next slide. 
It says, rather, I am a sinner if I rebuild the old system of the law. I already tore down. For when I tried to keep the law, it condemned me. So I died to the law. Why would you try to rebuild something you died to? In Romans, it's like, it's like the law was your old husband, and now you got a new husband, and you've died to that husband, but you're still letting him tell you what to do. You know, how you doing, honey? I don't feel good today. Why? What happened? Mr. Law came over. But you, you died to that covenant. You died to that relationship. You have no, he has no authority over your life anymore. I know, but he came and accused me again, knocked on the door, said, you still can't keep a house, can you? You still, look at the laundry. There's spots on the laundry. Look at you. And then Mr. Grace has got to say, what are you listening to him for? You're dead to him. He has no authority over your life. He has nothing. Even if you can't keep a good house, I love you. And we're going to work through that issue. But don't let him speak to you like that because he has no authority over you anymore. Somebody should have said amen right there. Somebody should have said woohoo. Somebody said that's true. Even if I don't get it, Holy Spirit, help me to get it because I need to get it. If you don't get it, it says, well, here's why you continue in sin, because you've forgotten that you've been cleansed from your old ways. It's the accuser. He's such a dog. I have already tore it down for when I tried to keep the law, condemn me, so I died the law, stopped trying to meet all his crimes so that I might live for God. Teaching people to obey the rules to get God's approval is not just wrong, it's sinful. Ah, uh, a bunch of sinners. I saw people smoking before church, a bunch of sinners. No, the sinner is the one who just brought that up. See, the Bible says the sinner is the one who brings accusation. The sinner is the one who's judgmental. The sinner is the one who keeps on pointing out. You know what God really doesn't like? Fault finders. Anyways, oh, settle down, pastor. You know, easy. All right, let me give you a little picture just for fun. You ready? How many like pictures? Gravity is the law. The law is perfect. How many know the law is perfect? So you can say, I'm not under the law. It doesn't change this. The law is perfect. You know, you're never going to get rid of the law because the law is right. Now, thank God the law isn't how you get a relationship with Jesus or with the Father. Aren't you glad about that? Because if you had to fulfill the whole law to get a relationship with God, I'd be pretty messed up. I'd be, oh, my God. I mean, I mean I'm not good at, you know, performance stuff. I'm just not good at that. You know, I like to fly by the seat of my pants and just kind of, you know, surf. <laughs> Have you noticed that? <laughs> the rules, I, I, I don't like rules. Like when Cheryl said, we got to put a sign, no, no drinks in the sanctuary, I went, oh, I hate that. Because somebody will do it, and then so they do it, and then somebody has to walk around, you have a drink in the sanctuary, can you please get out? And that's awkward, isn't it? And every time there's a rule, I immediately think of somebody's going to break it, and we're going to have that awkward time where we have to have a conversation with the rule breaker. You're here, you're within a relationship with somebody, and you're not married. We have a problem. We really do, and we need to have a conversation. But we need to have a conversation over a table face-to-face -face and have it and talk about it and find out. But here, look, you ready? There's an, that's an airplane. How many noticed an airplane? <laughs> what are you laughing at over there, huh? I didn't draw it myself. It's all right. So that's an airplane. See, we have lift, we have thrust, we have drag, and we have gravity. So those are all the things involved in getting us in the air. You know, being in the air is grace. It's an act of grace to get in the air. It's an act of grace to have the law fully fulfilled in your life. It's an act of grace. He did it for you. You are now the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus because of what he did. So you are in the air. I mean, I was in the air. I was in Josh Fairweather. He's, I don't think he's here today. But, but Josh Fairweather went with me to India on my second trip in 2001. And we were in the air. And I was in the plane. And we were in the air in the plane. And, and when we were, you know, waiting for the flight, I saw this little blow-up cushion that you could blow it up, put it around your neck. And I thought, that will keep my neck still nice and good, and I'll get a good sleep. And so I thought, I'm going to get that blow-up cushion. So I got this blow-up cushion. And I went, <laughs> and sure enough, I filled it as full as I possibly could. So then when we had our little dinner and stuff, and they were turning down the lights, I put this cushion around my neck, and I said, I'm going to have a little nap now. Got my lovely napping cushion, and I put my head back, and <laughs> But you know what? I blew that pillow so tight, I cut off the circulation to my head. <laughs> I am not kidding. So I'm, I'm asleep for about 20 minutes to a half an hour, and all of a sudden, 
I got up and I felt like I was going to vomit. And I was like all dizzy. And I was like, oh my Lord, I think I'm going to puke. What's going on? I tore that thing off my neck. I jumped over the guy beside me. I'm running to the bathroom. And then the steward just went, excuse me, sir. I have to replace the paper towels. And I went, <sighs> So she did that, you know, right away, you know what happened? He went, I passed out right in the floor, right by the exit aisle. And there was a, a, a senior a hockey team on their way to play in Europe. And they were all whacked to the teeth. And I fell out right across the floor, right in front of them. Gone. Out. I was in the plane and I fell out in the plane. The next thing I heard was, in the name of Jesus, oh Jesus, in Jesus' name, I, in the name of Jesus, in Jesus' name. And then I opened my eyes, and there's Josh Fairweather, scared to death. Never been out of Ontario, let out of the country, and here he is flying to India, and the guy that's supposed to be leading him is out on the floor. Jesus, in the name of Jesus. And I just looked up and went, what are you doing? He goes, Pastor, you passed out. I did. I, what, I did? What? Oh, yeah, what the heck happened there? And then the guy's sitting there going, I had a few too many drinks, buddy. <laughs> and then sure enough, the stewardess came and said, sir, did you have too much alcohol? I went, no, I didn't have any drinks. I, I think I, my pillow was too tight. So <laughs> then Joshua was concerned I might drop dead somewhere on the journey. He's like, oh, my God, I've never been out of the country and the pastor's dying. <laughs> now, why did I tell you all that? All of that happened. And you know, while all of that was going on, it didn't matter what was going on in the plane. It didn't even matter if my whole life and health were at risk. It didn't matter. I was still in the plane. I was still overcoming gravity because the thrust and the lift had overtaken the drag and the gravity. And I was in the air flying to my destination in the will and the purpose of God. What's interesting, I noticed when I put this up that if you turn the plane around, it almost looks like a cross. And you know how you defeat the law? You stay in Christ. You know how I defeated gravity? Stay in the plane. <laughs> it's not complicated. You could fall down in the plane. You could, you could backslide in the plane. You could do all kinds of crazy things in the plane. But you know what? If you're still in the plane, you're in the plane. You know, when you're in Christ and you've been in Christ, you're in Christ. What can take you out of my hand? What can separate you from my love? Stay in the plane. Sometimes when the planes crash, you go look at the black box and you find a lot of nonsense. I doubt it. I can't believe it. Oh, my God. Anyway, turn to your neighbor and say, stay in the plane. Stay in Christ Jesus. Stay in him. Trust him. He's faithful. I love that little line. He's faithful. He's true. He'll never leave me. He is good. He's good. Turn your neighbor. Shout at him. He's good. All right. Say, Pastor, come on. You said you'd be quick. I'm sorry I am. Okay. Oh, it's all good. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. I'll go on for another half an hour. All right. Let's, let's go a couple little things. Just Galatians 20, 20. Here it is up there. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live in the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Hello. I have that. I believe that. I am convinced of and I am in the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Give me another slide. Go ahead. When he speaks of the faith of Jesus Christ, he's not talking about Christ's faith. He's talk When he speaks of our faith in Christ... Anyway, he is talking about our, both are vital. Did you get that? Both are vital. The faith of Jesus Christ, our Savior's faithful performance on of all the Father's will is our covenant surety and our Redeemer. The notes are on the website. You can go read them later. Uh, Colossians 3.3. 3. Colossians 3.3. 3, For you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. How many know you died? When you got born again, you died. The water baptism is a sign and a symbol that you died with Christ. You were raised in him. You have been in Christ forever. You, are, you died with him. You were raised with him. You are seated with him in heavenly places. Settle down. I'm trying to finish. Philippians 3, 9. And be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ. The faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. So it's the faith of Christ which I have embraced by faith, which is really wonderful because where did my faith come from? Even my faith came from him too. So the faith that I'm exercising in the faith of Jesus Christ was a gift from God and he gave me the God kind of faith, the God kind of faith that can speak the miraculous and can agree with the faith of Christ. 
Wow, that was a lot of stuff. Amen. Settle down. Man, settle. folks, I'm sorry on the internet. I'm trying to finish, but they're shouting me down in the house. Glory to Jesus. Hallelujah. Galatians 3.22, but the scripture hath concluded all under sin that the promise may be by faith of Jesus Christ and it might be given to them that believe. That's your faith. See, but the scripture hath concluded all under sin, put everybody under sin so that the promise of faith, the faith of Jesus Christ may be given to all who believe. We put everybody, we took everybody and one big thing said all sinners so that now by the faith of Christ we could all be declared righteous. You've only got to believe. Any righteous folks in the house today? Give me a shout. All right, thank you, thank you. All right, Martin Luther, his Galatians commentary. He said, this is the truth of the gospel. Talking about Galatians 2.20. This is the truth of the gospel. It is also the principal article of all Christian doctrine, wherein the knowledge of all goodness, godliness consisteth. Most necessary it is, therefore, that we should know this article well, teach it to others, and beat it into their heads continually. I mean, Martin Luther said this verse, everybody's got to get it. If they don't get it, beat it into their heads. So uh, on the way out today, I have a big two-by-four with Galatians 2.20 on it. Whack! Thank you, Jesus. Here comes another whack! I wish it was that easy. I said, Lord, just give me a celestial two by four. I just go whack. Somebody comes in with the crazy stuff. I just go, that's crazy. Whack. Uh, thank you, Jesus. It's so much easier. All right, let me, let's go to Andrew Womack, his Galatians commentary. There are people today who've taken the dying to self doctrine to an extreme. And instead of being free of self, they're totally self-centered. They're so busy dying to self, they're self-occupied. The Christian life is not just hand uh, just a hand to live, it's impossible. Uh, not just, sorry, hard to live. Sorry, <laughs> glasses. No, the Christian life is not just hard to live. It's impossible to live in our human strength. The only way to walk in victory is to let Christ live through us. One more part. Paul experienced this death by simply reckoning what had already happened through Christ Jesus to be so. Just reckon it so. I'm dead to Christ? Yes, just reckon it so. How do you reckon it so? Say, I agree with that. You don't have to die every day. You're dead. I'm dead. You are. I agree. I reckon so. You are dead to Christ. Failure to understand the simple truth is the root of all legalism and performance mentality. The law focuses on the outer man and tells it what it must do. Grace focuses on the inner man and tells it what is already done through Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. It's already done. But you don't believe it's already done because you're not seeing the results you think you need. And you're an inspector of the growth of every believer. Stop it. Okay, thanks for that, Pastor. By union with Christ, last one, oh, there it is, wow. By union with Christ, we are radically transformed. We can no longer go back to our old life, for in Christ we are a new creation. Second Corinthians 5, 17, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away, behold, all things have become new. I think a lot of that fit in with the prophetic word today as well. All right, I need a couple of strong men to bring that little jail cell over. A couple strong men bring that jail cell over. And Cheryl, I'm sorry to say, but you were the worst worshiper of the day. So you are getting locked up. I'm just kidding, honey. You weren't. You're the most awesome worshiper. You inspire me when you worship. It's awesome. I come closer to Jesus just watching the reflection of his eyes in yours. But honey, I am going to put you in the cell. Okay, right there is good. Just slide her back there. Bing, bang. All right, that's good. All right, door's right here. All right, we're going to close in prayer. We're going to finish the sermon next week. Jesus. <laughs> okay, now, what does that represent? We're locked up. We're, we're slaves. We're in bondage to a life of sin, a life of pain, all these things, all right? Look at that. I mean, look at this poor person locked up in a life of sin, can't help themselves, can't do anything about it. There's nothing they can do to get them out. So Jesus comes along, and Jesus does everything necessary to totally set her free. So bing, bang, totally free. By faith in that, she accesses the door, and she gets out, right? So she's out. Now, she got out, she believed on Jesus, and she's free, but she sinned. So back in the door, 
back in here. You totally screwed up. I don't know what happened. Might have been a bad confession, something there. I don't know why, but it didn't work for her. All right, who's next? That's not what happened. All right, come on out. So she's free. You see, you don't just get free from a life of sin and free from the devil. You get put into something. You don't just take it out of, out of the kingdom of darkness. You get put into the kingdom of light. Now, I would have chose a white sheet for this, but Cheryl chose a brown one. You see, now, when you were born again, you literally have exercised faith in the faith of Christ, which means you have been in Christed, which now means that you are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. So what do we see? Oh, yeah, let me give you that. That's awesome. In Christ. So you don't just get out of there. You're not just out of the kingdom of darkness. You get translated and transferred into the kingdom of light. And in the kingdom of light, there is no darkness at all. None. No darkness at all. But what if I screw up? Isn't that darkness? It is, but you're in the kingdom of light. And in the kingdom of light, there's no darkness at all. Well, I must have stepped out of the kingdom of light to do a dark deed. No, see, that's the stupid mentality that people think that I screwed up, so I get locked up again. No, who the sun sets free is free in deed. Thoroughly, completely, body, soul, spirit set absolutely free. But you know what? Inside the Christ thing, there's stuff going on. The Holy Spirit is working on that person. And just like I was on the airplane and I passed out because I put the pillow too tight, stuff is happening under there. And sometimes we're like, I wonder what's going on. I wonder how their journey with God is going. I wonder what's going on. <gasps> She's still really screwed up. Oh, she needs to go to a seminar because she's really screwed up. Oh, she's still dealing with sin issues. Oh, you know what we better do? We better add her to a class on behavior modification because she got delivered from the kingdom of darkness. She got put in the kingdom of his son, but she's still not quite there. I'm there. We're going to send her to a conference with a group of people like us, the I'm There conference. Peter even left Paul's conference to join our conference because we're the I'm There conference. You know, Paul would show up to our I'm There conference and he would shout us down to our face and he would say, you are to be condemned. Well, come on, pastor. I mean, we see people get saved and you give them that watered down gospel and they never change. Who do you think you are? No, you have to stay. But we, we got so many faith inspectors, so many people. We got so many people. I mean, that's what it says. We got a lot of teachers, but not a lot of fathers. Got a lot of people ready to tell you what your business is. Blah, blah, blah. You know, people really need help. Do you really believe that when you confess Christ as Lord and Savior, that you get brought into Christ and you're totally set free and you're brought into an absolute relationship with the Father? Do you really believe that? Do you believe somebody who did that could still successfully sin? How bad can it get? Sometimes it gets pretty bad. Sometimes they get delivered instantly, and it's awesome. And I've seen people delivered instantly 10 years later go through a crazy struggle. Doubt everything. John the Baptist said, behold the Lamb of God. A couple years later, he's going, is he the one? And then, you know, when you go through a struggle, yeah, you can take it off. I'm sorry. It's, it's getting hot in you know, when people go through struggles and they're going through processes of growing up and helping, I mean, sadly, we think that the only alternative is, well, maybe they didn't get it done right. We should just discard them back to the cell and not hang out with that because, oh, my God. But, you know, that's what Paul was talking about here. That's the stuff where you're saying you're changing the gospel. And you know what you're saying if you believe that? You do not believe in the transformative power of the Spirit of God in people's lives. You do not really believe that accepting Jesus as your Lord and Savior, that a miracle took place, that he who begun a good work in you is going to complete it to the day of Christ Jesus. Well, it's not happening fast enough. For who? It'll happen fast. I'm believing for the acceleration. I'm believing for the, I want to see it. Believe me, like I said, if I had a two by four, I said, bam, <laughs> let's get this done. Because you know what? It's hard to counsel devils. Rather just cast them out. That kind of revival, we need a power revival where people get just powerfully transformed by the power of God. But, you know, so many people got out of there, and they're not sure they're out because they've successfully behaved wrong. And then they come into churches, and they get condemned. There's people who get out, and they're still a little confused about some issues in their life. 
and they're barely born again. They're barely experiencing the joy of the Lord. And somebody pounds their head and says, well, your behavior is wrong. You better get your stuff together. And then we get all kinds of people running around. We had an email this week from somebody who said, your webpage looks really welcoming. It says that you're very accepting. If I come, will you try to change me? And I'm like, you betcha. <laughs> no, if I'll come, you can join the journey with all the rest of us that are on the way. And some of us think we're a little further than others. You're special. But you know, if anybody thinks there's something, it says don't. Because if you're anything, it's him. And if you think what you have is because you worked it out, I got to step away from you because pride comes before a fall and a haughty look before destruction. Got to be careful when you think you're all that. See, I am all that, but I don't think I'm all that. I think he's all that. And because he's all that, I'm all that. And that's how I can be free to be all that. Even when I'm not all that, I still exercise faith in the worst times of my life that I am all that to overcome the not all that to be all that. Did you get all that? I hope you got all that because all that was really good. Come on, bow your heads, you're going to pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, love you, bless you, thank you. Thank you for the Apostle Paul. Thank you for your wisdom of putting the Epistle of the Galatians there. Thank you that, you know, there's truths so relevant even for us today that we sometimes just read the Epistles and, and don't really get the depth of meaning and the truth that's there. But Father, help us. Thank you for this journey we're on in this living word. And thank you for the living word that breaks the living word. Thank you for your kindness and your goodness. Thank you that Paul and Peter after this were still friends, even though they had a pretty serious interaction right here. But after that, even Peter said, man, Paul's a pretty awesome dude. And Paul had great things to say about Peter. But you know, sometimes on the journey, thank God that people are willing to, to be confronted and be okay. I mean, Peter... I mean, the, the rock that the real, whole thing is built on. He had to be confronted. He, he literally forgot what the gospel really was and had to get confronted. You need to come back to center, pal. Sometimes we need to do that. Sometimes we've been on the journey for a long way and we've lost really what it's all about. We got a whole religious behavior club. You know, I see your attendance badges. That's awesome, but so what? Lord Jesus, thank you. If I do anything, if I've been faithful in any way, it's your faithfulness that I stand in. The faithfulness that you demand, I could never, ever give. The holiness that you require, I could never, ever be. But thank you that in Christ Jesus, I can say, I am holy. I am righteous. I have done everything well. Father, there may be people here today who just need you. They, they need a fresh touch of you. They need to realize that they are free, that they're on the journey, that they're in Christ. But they need to just, you know, relax. Quit striving. It's not about the striving. It's about the resting in the finished work. Let him do it. Let him work in you because he will and you can trust him. That that thing that you think you're trying to overcome and die to, die to, die to, I have been crucified with Christ. Let it go right now. Maybe you're here today and you've never just made that decision to say, look, I want Jesus. You never said, hey, I receive you as my Lord and Savior. Well, the offer is out right now. It says to whosoever will. It says anyone who receives him, he gives them the right and the privilege to become children of God. So right now, I'm just going to ask you, if that's you, right where you are, nobody's looking around, it's just you. But maybe you need to say, today I want to join the family. Today I want to receive Jesus as my Lord and Savior. If that's you, I'm going to count to three and then just throw up your hand. Are you ready? One, two, three. Three, just lift your hand really high, right now, really high, wherever you are. Anyone at all, anyone. Everyone who needs Jesus is on vacation. <laughs> Father, we love you, we bless you. I thank you for your goodness and your kindness. I thank you for each one in the house today. I thank you for Impact Church. What a, what a super duper privilege it is to serve this wonderful flock. And Lord, I bless them today, each and every one. Thank you for the beautiful weather we're going to have this week and all that we experience. All those on vacation enjoying this wonderful creation. Bless them. 
just refresh them surround them with your goodness lord i bless this house now i command the love of the father to be revealed to them in a new way i pray your grace lord would wrap and surround them each and every one and holy spirit your continued companionship your fellowship you walking with us each and every day manifesting your glory let it be continued in each and every life right now in the precious and wonderful name of jesus and everybody said amen